Welcome to If the Walls Could Talk, a series of conversations about smart buildings, connecting key thinkers in the property world with each other and you. I'm Ari Berendrecht, founder and CEO of Wired Score, a certification company dedicated to making the world's buildings smarter and better connected. In this series, we discuss all kinds of topics from planning a smart building to how to create technology that actually works, reducing the environmental impact of smart buildings, and the importance of design and how to create the best experience for all users of buildings. And it's design that we're gonna talk about today with a specific focus on one of London's smartest spaces, 22 Bishopsgate. It's a seriously impressive building with a bold ambition to put its occupiers and their needs at the center of everything. I'm delighted to welcome two guests who know more than most about how 22 works. Firstly, we have Peter Bicknell, the head of engineering at 22 Bishopsgate in London via JLL, and Philip Schaus, senior asset manager at AXA Real Estate. Philip, could you tell us a little bit about it and explain why it's such a significant building? We never boast about how big or how large 22 Bishopsgate is. It's about the people and the occupiers in the building, and it's very much a case of what um, you know, what the building can do for occupiers, as opposed to the stats on the size and everything else. But that said, um, obviously we're about one and a quarter million square feet. Um, we are in the central business district of the area of the city of London, and um, you know, from there we're functioning. We've, we have a prediction of about twelve thousand occupiers in the building. So we didn't want um, this just to appear to be a large skyscraper in the middle of London with glass clad. It was it was bringing the building to life. For the people and what we could occupy, we could offer our occupiers to actually make the building a place that they choose to work, and that was thinking about the environment in the building, the amenities we're offering in the building, um, and and the, and the experience of our occupiers and users of the building to make it as as comfortable environmentally for them, as welcoming as possible in terms of its infrastructure for the occupier journey into the building through our active community park, which is encouraging alternative active transport means through cycling, walking, running clubs, um, and are very much our hosts. I think one of the first things that you notice about coming into our building is that there is no reception desk. Um, and, 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 and a lot of people have said, well, where's the reception desk? The whole point of 22 Bishopsgate is we're not people processing. If you're coming to our building, you're not, you're not treated like an alien. Um, and as a visit, as a guest, you are treated as an occupier. So through our app, you'll get an invite to come to the building. That app, will, that invite will set out how to get to us, where, where, which staircase to go to, and we'll include a code to get you through our gates downstairs. So for you, it can be a seamless process. As a guest, you could just walk straight through the building, present your, your pass at the gates, and through you go, and you follow the directions on your app. So it's all about not making people feel processed and, and really welcoming. 22 Bishopsgate is Wired Score Platinum. It's undergoing Smart Score certification. And it's clear that the implementation and use of smart technology is core to the vision for the building and delivering the experience that, that Philip described. From a practical standpoint, how do you kind of take the first steps in planning for a smart building? What are the first like decisions you need to make in the process? I sort of uh, analyze uh, the, the smart building um, um, very much like a, 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 a mobile phone. Um, we all have various degrees of mobile phones and, and each one of our mobile phones is different, um, but it's all built on the same platform. We have a standard platform with a, a standard set of functionality and we, and we adapt our mobile phones to suit our own personal preferences. And and, and I think that's what we're, we're, we're doing at 22. We, we, we've got a, a, a very, very strong, the most modern mobile phone that we can have. And, and how do we adapt that that smart technologies at 22 to meet our own personal requirements? And those and those personal requirements being the requirements of the occupiers at 22, and to understand what smart really means um, and and how it benefits the, those occupiers and how it meets uh, um, our requirements and our, our commitments. So the, the the fundamental part of that smart score, I suppose, is is to to ascertain that. 
And, and one of the challenges with, with uh, as we all know, only mobile phones, it, it, it is there's always a new version. There's, there's always going to be something newer and smarter and that's going to come across. And, and, and one of the challenges is, is we have at 22 is, is we've got a very, very capable building here and making sure that we tailor and, uh, and drive that capable building in the right way to maintain that smart credibility and, main, and, and keep on adapting to, to smart technologies, but not just taking things off because they look good, making sure that they benefit our occupiers, our ambitions and our commitments within the building. You've both mentioned the importance of defining what the building should do. What are the user requirements the building will fulfill? Uh, can you talk about like how did you um, define and prioritize what the building would do for its users? And like who's in the room for that conversation? Um, and how do you prioritize what, what those what those requirements or story user stories would be? The outset of the journey for us was um, to understand how our building was performing and, and the services it was providing to its occupiers. Um, so that started out as a, as a digital twin. From there, we moved on to um, looking at what really is the maximum benefit of that. And then that came back to the two fundamental issues of the energy monitoring of our building. Um, you know, we had to tie together 3,000 smart meters as part of our asset initiative and registration process. And we also have, we started to look at the planned predictive maintenance. And those two key core elements, energy monitoring and planned predictive maintenance, were at the core of our outset in terms of how we thought we could control the environment through this one pane of glass, um, making it easy as possible for not only our occupiers, but our service providers and, and Pete, his head of engineering, to actually understand at a click what this building's doing, how it's performing against its benchmarks, uh, and, and is it achieving what we set out to get? It sounds like once you have the North Star of the kind of people first mindset and in, in the, the things the building will do for its users, there's a step where you're kind of mapping the user stories to the technology foundations and, and applications itself. Could you talk about how you go from what you want the building to do to actually making it happen? We have over 3,000 smart meters, not just measuring electricity, they measure gas consumption, heating and cooling, they, they, they measure the lighting that's being utilized, the small power th through 1.3 million square feet. A massive amount of data being collated every 15 minutes. And, 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 and it's walking through that smart technology roadmap on how we're going to utilize that data, what, how it meets with our, our commitment, for example, on environmental sustainability, and then, then how do we how do we be the forefront and the best in class of service with that data? And and, and we actually uh, uh, are use, using smart AI, and the smart AI is based on each individual business's requirements. So we're, depending on what you're doing within the building, we can tailor that. So we now report on a monthly basis automatically through smart AI to every single occupier in this building on how they're using their energy, how it's being deployed throughout their operating hours, throughout their, their evenings and weekends, how it's identified uh, um, where there's losses or where there's savings. Any fault we now see, we can identify through the energy monitoring platform the input to that fault to the building. So if we see a, a, a piece of equipment in heating and cooling, for example, we can actually put a, a cost you know, down to the penny on how much that fault has cost us. And because we've identified it early and, and rectified that fault efficiently, we can actually see how much energy we've saved and how much how much finance we've saved both to the occupier and ourselves. So, so it's drawing together, you know, using all of these different smart technologies to give that that one seamless uh, 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 level of service, that, that level of reliability and, and, and minimize the impact of the occupier working in the environment. And, and, and that that's smart. And, and all of those different aspects provide that service and come up with that ultimate goal. I'd love to talk about one other kind of feature of the building, a technology pillar, which is your, your app that tenants use. How does it integrate with the rest of 22 Bishop's Gate? We spoke to quite a lot of service providers who were offering to write the building app for us. But a lot of them were coming at this from the point of view of trying to reinvent the wheel that already existed. You know, we didn't need an app to tell people what the trains were doing and what the weather was doing outside or, or, or what was the latest news. Everybody's got that on their phone. They didn't need to reinvent that in through our building app. What we really wanted to do was be able to host multiple technologies through the app. So it's got future proofing. And, and, and we, we suddenly, 
realized that we only wanted the app initially as a start, if it was a success, was to do two things, um, was to get people in and out of the building, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of occupiers and visitors, and also to use the marketing on the market on level two, which is where we have our, our restaurant for our occupiers of the building. Uh, and, and it was fundamental that if you just used your app for those two functions, we would be really pleased. Some our occupiers, when they first came, were saying, no, we must have card entry into the building. And we're saying, well, the card entry is so, so, so old fashioned now. Use the app. It's what everybody's got. Nobody leaves home without their phone. Everybody leaves home without their card for work. Nobody will go anywhere without their phone nowadays. Uh, and we've gone to the extent, again, by, by working with our occupiers in collaboration with them, that some of those that were saying, we're never going to use, use the app, we're always going to use the card, have actually gone completely the other way. They've embraced the app, which is what we want them to do. They've rolled that out to their own front door. Uh, and, and it's it's just such an, it's so nice to see people turn around and realize this smart technology does make their life easier. I'm sure it's not as easy as it, as it sounds. Uh, Peter, how do you make sure an app uh, works with all the technologies that it needs to, to create the experience that Philip describes? One of the things we've been very careful in, in doing here is actually, is actually not appointing one single uh, a, a smart provider. So, so we've actually gone through specialist providers for, for the, their functionalities. One of the things we encourage at 22 as well is, is, is actually they come and work with us. They come to 22 and, and, and we have a lovely facilities management office. They come down here and, and, and spend some time in London seeing what we're doing and seeing what, what other service partners are doing and, 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 and working together to deliver that functionality. It's a genuine partnership to understand what our occupiers want and deliver what they want, not what we want to give them and what we think they should have. It's a two-way street, not a one-way street with 22. And, you know, it is about adapting and moving forwards and constant change and sharing knowledge. We're not, we're not closed doors. We welcome people in to see how we're working, see what the building does to exchange ideas and learn from that together. And, and, and you know, that, that's, that's a new way of dealing with the building. We hear the term all the time, future proof and future ready, and you've, you've both given really good examples of what that actually means in practice. Um, I think in closing, what I'd love to do is, is clearly going through the, um, the kind of development and creation of this building and now the operations of this building. Um, it's been quite an achievement, and I'm sure there's things you know now uh, through the, the creation of 22 Bishop's Gate that you didn't know before. One of the key things is technologies today are advancing so fast, they're actually outpacing the time it takes to build these buildings. So, um, uh, so, so, so what we're dictating in it, it, the design stage isn't necessarily the best technology at the practical completion stage. And, and that needs, we, they, I think designers and, and the builders need to, to bear that in mind when they're scoping out these jobs. Of, 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 and it's very difficult to do and, and, and sort of look ahead and think, well, what can I do with the building in three or four years time when it finishes? But, but, but also to just to keep an open mind on, on what they can do because technology, um, fortunately, it, it is advancing so quickly. And I, I think from my perspective, I, I would probably, sanction that as well in terms of you know from, from from the investor's point of view is to listen to your service providers to listen to your occupiers uh, um, be ready willing and able to be flexible and to learn we, we don't we, you know we recognize we may not always get this right um, and that's the beauty of technology it's changing and we have to be able to embrace the change and and, and, and to see the opportunities coming through from that change um, and, and deliver what occupiers genuinely want there's no point just sticking our heads in the sand and saying, we've got it right, we know what we're doing. Um, we think this is how you should occupy the building. The building is for them to occupy and, and make the best use of. And as we come back to one of our core things is, this is the building where we generally want people to choose to want to work. Well said, well said, perfect. Um, I think we should wrap it up there. Um, thank you both for sharing uh, your experience with, with me and with our viewers. Um, I have full confidence that if the real estate industry is headed the direction of 22 Bishop's Cape that we're in, in really good hands. So uh, appreciate your leadership. And to the viewers, that's it for this episode. Thank you for watching. Uh, as you know, there's a lot more videos on our YouTube channel and we will see you all next time. Thank you very much.